I invite you to take your Bibles into your hands. We'll be reading out of Luke chapter 16. It will be the subject of this morning's sermon. Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and in fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abram's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from here, from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful for your infallible and inerrant living word. You have given it it to us to train us in all what is necessary for life and godliness. And we pray that you would bless Pastor Eugene as he delivers your word this morning. May his sermon not be, may may his word not rely on plausible words of wisdom, Lord, but in the spirit and the power of the spirit. May you speak to our hearts and transform us with your word. We pray this in Christ's name and for your glory. Amen. You may be seated. As we study the Gospel of Luke, and uh, this morning we're at the end of chapter 16, and we're going to study this story about the rich man and Lazarus as it presented by our Lord Jesus Christ. But this morning I want to look at the most frequent fulfilled prophecy of all, the, the one event that God promised would happen and warned everyone to be prepared for, and yet it takes almost everyone off guard by surprise. And this is, of course, physical death and the judgment of God upon all who died in their sins. Every second, two people die somewhere in this world. Have you ever thought what happened just one moment after death so that we would know and be ready jesus instructs us in this passage in his word he lets us know that the death or physical death not the end of life it just changed the location there's no termination termination of conscious existence of human being 
what will happen to anyone who ignores or rejects the word of God. And as we open the chapter 16, as we study this story, we open to Christ clearest and most compelling words about what happened at the moment of death, physical death, to every human being that will ever live on this earth. We find more details in less space than anywhere else in the Bible from this story. This is Christ's guide to the afterlife and was one of the most priceless insights anyone could get on for our endless future and eternity. In just 300 words of this story, Jesus outlines the truth about our eternal existence that each of us will possess at the moment we pass through the door of physical death out of our daily life on this earth. Mankind doubts the wrath of God against sinners. They say it's just not his character. He is God of love. Does they hold no fear of God? This lack of godly fear encourages a lack of concern about sin. Our society has become immoral as a consequence. Our non-moral society rejects all concerns about morality in life and its decisions. Thus society lives without regard for offenses against God. Instead, it loudly protests against God in numerous ways. It proclaims, eat, drinks, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And there's no consequences. Mankind pursues an irrational, emotional, romantic life. They say, if it feels good, do it. Proudly, men and women display confidence in, in, in their inner subjective intuition. I'm the captain of my ship. I will do what I want and when I want. These claims dismisses the reality of hell, the eternal punishment of God against sinners. But the Bible clearly declares God's hatred for sin. He abhors, he hates every evil doer. Psalm 5. This is the passage that recites a message of Jesus about this very topic. It plainly explains the reality of God's judgment against unbelievers. In this story, Jesus recounted the lives of a rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was exceedingly rich and Lazarus was exceedingly poor or extremely poor in this story. Jesus presented a story of contrast. Not of their financial and physical well-being, but more about different spiritual conditions and their consequences when each of them passed from this earth. From this passage, we will identify several important truths about the eternal destiny of every man or woman. Especially the judgment and the wrath of God against unbelievers. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will clarify these truths to you and apply them in your life. And before we're going to study this, I just want to make an observation with you and persuade you that this is not a parable. But this is the real story. This is the real story. And first of all. And I have a three reasons or three arguments that this is the real story. And first of all, Bible does not say that this is a parable. In the usual pattern of teaching of Jesus, if you turn back to, to uh, chapter 15, so he told them the parable in verse 3. And then he told three parables. Second reason why it is not parable that I believe it is true story because you would not find anywhere in Jesus' parable that he uses actual names of people. Never. And here we find the name of Lazarus. But probably you would think, that, but who knows? 
who knows who Lazarus was. But there is a name of a very famous person in the Old Testament, the patriarch Abraham. And every listener at that time knew the name of Abraham. So Jesus never did that. And second uh, is the reason or question of integrity. Imagine if I would be preaching from here and I, and I would be using any of your names. For example, let's, let's pick our uh, pastor Dmitri. And I'm going to tell you the story that we went fishing with him once. And I'm going to describe the details of that story in very fascinating ways. And, they, and then after sermon, Dmitri would come up to me and say, Eugene, it never happened. You presented this as a real story, but it never happened. This is not true story. And I would say to him, yeah, that's fake story. I made up that story for the sake of illustration. He probably would tell me, you should have emphasized that, that this is not the real story. In the beginning of the story. And this is what I expect from Jesus. Imagine that Jesus would using some kind of conversations of Abraham with Lazarus and with rich men. And it actually never happened. We would expect for him to emphasize that. That this is parable. And this is not real story. This is the illustration that he made up to illustrate certain points. But he didn't do that. And if you think about the only Jesus who came from the spiritual world can tell stories like these. But if you're not persuaded and if you still believe that this is parable, I would love you the same. I would love you the same and eventually, ultimately, this is, would not change the lessons from this story that we're going to study this morning. And we'll see the importance of those, de those details for our life. So we will learn this morning how these two people in this story were divided and were different in their earthly lives, in their eternal destinies, and in their responses to God's word. And the first section we find in verses 19 to, to 20, two different lives, two different lives. But before we study this story, I want to remind you the context of Luke 16. In Luke 16, Jesus is talking to Pharisees who were lovers of money. In verse 14, we find that statement. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all this and they ridiculed him. He had told them the parable of the unrighteous steward in verses 1 to 13. The point of that parable is that the way you use your money can make or break your eternal destiny. In verse 19, Jesus says, I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwelling. In other words, money is going to fail. It will fail. Money will not do good at all on your deathbed. And whether you have eternal dwelling will depend, at least in part, on whether you use your money in advance the cause of Christ for Christ's kingdom on this earth, for the lives of others, or whether you use it to advance your comfort and your own luxuries and your sinful desires of your flesh. In other words, the possession of money in this world is a test run for eternity. Can you pass the test of faithfulness with your money? This is the question. Do you use it as a means to, to, to prove the worth of God and joy you have in supporting His purposes 
and live for His purposes on this earth? Or does the way you use it prove that what you really enjoy is the things of this world and not God? Verse 14 says the Pharisees hear all this and ridicule Jesus because they, uh, they are lovers of money. Christ has touched the wrong nerve of their lives. Beneath all the religious surface, they love money. Jesus saw it and he nailed it. So what is the real meaning of this ridicule? In verse 15, gives, in verse 15 gives us the real meaning. They are trying to justify themselves instead of repentance. Instead of repentance, which would have opened the way to receive Christ as Messiah. For who he really is. This radical teacher of righteousness, the Pharisee, trying, was trying, they were trying to justify themselves by making Jesus look foolish with their ridicule and your scoffing. So Jesus contrasts two lives and two character in this story. First, there's a rich man. Each new phrase builds a picture of this man. The point Jesus is making is about the luxury in which he lived on this earth. His clothing was purple and fine linen. In modern terms, those robes would cost between 75000 to 100000 even today, a normal person would never be able to afford this kind of attire in which each outfit would require an average person to spend his entire earning from one year to three years. Depends on your salary. There's one of the most expensive tailor-made men's suit in our modern days for $100,000. It has nine buttons of 18 karat gold and diamonds. And this man was wearing this kind of clothing every day. This is what this story says and Jesus says. He was extremely successful. The text says he lived, in, he lived joyously and in splendor every day. Every day of his life was another day of success for him. He lived a life of ease and pleasure every single day. He was extravagant about his wealth and displayed himself that the way he lived every day, that people would notice that. This rich man ate a luxury feast every day. In fact, the Greek word Luke uses denounce a gourmet feeding and exotic and costly dishes. And Jesus emphasized that he did this every day. This rich man not only didn't have to work, it seems, from this story, but he also was feasting every day. This paints a picture by Christ of an idle, self-indulgent person. Then Jesus gives a description of a different life of a poor man named Lazarus. He was extremely poor in complete contrast to the rich man. Lazarus was very poor. This word means he was at the poverty level in which, level in which he had to even ask for food and beg for food. He was totally helpless. The verb was laid indicates Lazarus was totally incapable of moving himself. And that verb indicates that he had been moved in front of, his, of, of this man's gate for some period of time. He had to be carried and dropped off at the gate of this man's house. And Jesus continues and he says that he was very sick. Jesus says that Lazarus was covered with sores. This particular word used by a medical doctor, Luke, describes a very serious ulcerous type of sores that was very visible on his body. 
He was a very sick man. And he was desperately hungry. Lazarus was so hungry that he would actually sit at the gate of the rich man's home hoping to get any leftovers from any meal. When Lazarus waited for the crumbs that fell from rich man's table, it is another insight into the biblical world. In Christ's time, most people had no knives, no forks, no napkins. They were eating using their own hands. But very wealthy houses, the rich would clean their hands by wiping them on, on chunks of bread. This was their napkins that they used in that time. And that chunks of bread, which would be discarded and by the servants into the trash. Now Lazarus sat by the trash, thankfully getting any chunks of used hand cleaner bread. Lazarus was totally alone in verse 21. The only friends he had were dogs. The dogs would come to this man and lick his wounds. He got some crumbs. He probably shared it with the dogs. Name Lazarus is a Latin form of the Hebrew name Eliezer, which means God is my help. Eliezer or Lazarus was totally helpless, sick starving beggar covered with sores this story describes two drastically different lifestyles completely different lifestyles but i just want to remind you the theology of the pharisees and jewish leaders they believe in their theology that if person is rich he is blessed by god and he is righteous and if person is poor, he is cursed from God because he is a sinner. And God cursed him for specific sins. And Jesus is crushing their false understanding of Scripture. And then we read that those two men died. And this is the next section of the story. Two different destinies. Two different eternal destinies for those two men. Jesus gives a description of both dying and living this world. Eventually it came time for both men to die. Death, death I'm sorry, does not play favorites. It is the great equalizer of all men, absolutely all men on this earth. Sooner or later, whether one is poor or rich, men die regardless of wealth, social status, or achievement. All men will die. When the rich man died, the text says he was buried. This would indicate he had a very impressive funeral. He would have had a lavish funeral with business associate and powerful people coming to mourn the loss of this business magnate. There were probably lots of tributes and donations and flowers to honor this wealthy man. Perhaps there were moments of silence the gatherings and social events like one we would have for famous Kobe Bryant. This was famous, rich person that had influence to other people. And he was buried this way with recognition and praise. Then Jesus gives the description of what Lazarus experienced after death. The description of what happened to Lazarus after death is wonderful. There is no question that Lazarus did go to a real place when he died. And we can make some observation. He was carried by angels into Abraham's 
bosom. Lazarus did not get a lavish funeral. Maybe not even funeral at all. Maybe there was no single person to bury his body. Because he was so lonely. Live with dogs. But he did uh, get an angelic welcome, an angelic ride after his death. Angels were there to ex escort him to a wonderful place called Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is not heaven, but it is a heavenly type place. It was the place where the Old Testament believers went when they died. It was a place of intimate fellowship and comfort of old believers old testament believers until jesus christ died on the cross and rose again he was in a place of desirable existence this is a very privileged place to be the rich man wanted to be there and he wanted his brothers to be to go there interesting to know that no angels escorted him to his to this desirable location he was just found in hell in this passage and Lazarus was in a place of total comfort life for Lazarus at this point was no longer sad anymore he was in complete place of comfort there was an instant change of condition for Lazarus then Jesus gives a description of what the rich man experienced in hell the rich man went to the Hades Hades is a hellish place of fire where unbelievers go when they die until they are sentenced to the eternal lake of fire at the great white throne judgment which we read in the Revelation chapter 20 When Jesus Christ speaks of hell, you better take it seriously because he speaks of a literal hell more than any other person in the Bible. Imagine this, that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about hell more than any other person in Scripture. Because he knows that place and what people experience in that place. And there are some facts of this passage that Jesus Christ brings out about hell. Hell is a place of horrible fire torment. The word torment and the word agony we find in verses 23, 24, 28, 25. Those words are scary. The word torment describes a pain that is torturous. The word agony describes a pain that is at a deep suffering level. And combine these two words describe hell as a horrible place of eternal burning pain and suffering. This is excruciating pain that never ends. Hades is a place where the burning never ceases. It is a torturous place. Pain. the fire never burns a person up because it is a place when the womb does not die and we read this in mark 9 hell is a place of total consciousness there is a very real consciousness for one who is in hell there is no such thing as a as a sleeping soul the rich man was very much aware of his presence and pain. He was well aware that he was being tormented and Lazarus was not. But irony in life, he saw Lazarus who needed his help when he lived on earth. And here he sees Lazarus and he needs his help right now. Hell is a place of no mercy. Hell is a place of no mercy. Once one is in hell, there is no chance of experience the grace or mercy of God whatsoever. Crying out to God for grace and mercy will not work, will be of no benefit. 
what good was the money this rich man had now he is in pain and sufferings he would trade all the money that he had for one drop of water on the tip of someone's finger In hell, you do not even mercifully get one drop or drip of water. The irony is that one drop of living water can keep you out of hell. One drink of living water will guarantee you will never burn in the fires of hell. And Jesus is the living water. And invite Jesus Christ into your life and you will never experience hell. And you will escape forever the eternal fire of eternal hell. And this is the time. And now, now on this earth, this is the time to experience God's grace and God's mercy. Now this is the time of salvation when we call upon His name and be saved. From eternal wrath of God. Hell is a place of a complete memory. A person in hell has a very real and vivid memory. There is no such thing as, as dementia or, or, or Alzheimer in hell. Every person's memory will be as sharp as, as a tack. A rich man remembered his previous life. He remembered his lost family and even had concern over them. He remembered God's word. Hell is a, a place of no possible escape. No possible escape. A person who goes to hell will never get out. There is no such thing as a purgatory or second chances after physical death a person's destiny at the moment of death is irreversible forever and ever no one can call a person out of hell no one can pray him out no candles will get him out one in hell burns there forever and ever Now, many liberal theologians ask what kind of God would put people into a place of endless, fiery torture. I read many books by many liberal theologians who try to advocate for God. And they are saying that hell is not eternal. But I came to the very vivid conclusion why that theological views, are, they exist. Because we are, as sinners, in our sinful nature, we have a problem. We take sin too lightly. And this is why we come to this kind of just wrath of God against sinners. And we conclude, oh, okay, this is proportionally not just. Because imagine if a person lived for 70, 80 years and commit sin all the time, and now he has to pay for that for eternity. But the problem is not this. How long in time we were committing sins, but against whom? And we, we, we sin against the highest dignity in the universe. So the punishment must be the highest possible that exists. And our problem in our sinful nature, when, we, when we're faced with these passages like this, and we think this is not justice. But in my personal life, I passed that line. I know my own sinfulness. And I know the sinfulness of our humanity. That this is actually what we deserve. This is what 
we deserve and this is the 100 percent true pure justice against sinners and i'm not astonished about this but uh, what i'm astonished about is not eternal hell But what I am amazed about that God who put his son on the cross to die so you don't have to go there. What we astonished as Christian is about salvation. That God, the holy God, righteous God, crushed his son on the cross. So in order for us to escape this place of eternal punishment. And one who end up in hell, the person who refuses to trust the word of God and Jesus Christ. In fact, the Pharisees trusted their money and would not trust Jesus Christ or the word of God. This rich man had a lot of money. But he did not have a relationship with God. He did not believe God's word. That's why he ended up, he ended up in hell. And Jesus the Christ doesn't even name that person. Wicked people aren't remembered in eternity. This is what we read in Psalms. Drastic change of events for both. One had to die alone, no God, no grace, no hope, just utterly, eternally alone. Yet this is the experience of every person who lives and dies without Jesus. When death came or comes to, to claim the last man, he dies absolutely alone, cut off from the living and the dead with nothing before him but the endless eternity to experience undiluted wrath of God forever and ever and it doesn't matter what kind of funeral that person had in contrast when Lazarus died his death was attended by angels they received him and took him to dwell in paradise Maybe no one had any interest for that person on earth, but God was interested in him. And God dispatched angels to conduct him into the place of eternal rest. This is important for us to understand, my dear friends. Many people believe that all these truths concerning the hell are just symbolic. But you have to understand, even if there is symbolic language here, we cannot even express and describe the eternal hell properly. We have no ability to properly explain and understand and imagine what hell is and that's why friend if you are lost this morning we are pleading with you that you would rec be reconciled to God because there is an eternal judgment and eternal punishment and that is coming for sure while the rich man suffered Lazarus was comforted he seized from his burdens. He is free from diseases. And when, when scripture described the, the place for the saints, it is a place free from cares of this world, from pains of this world. It is a place of 
incomparable beauty and joy with God. It is a place where God himself dwells and where his people will see his face. It is a place where sin and sinners and Satan are forever banished and the presence of sin removed forever. Please notice with me a very important thing from this passage. The rich man calls out in verse 24, 24 Father Abraham, Father Abraham. In other words, words this man is a Jew but the problem his Jewishness has not saved him doesn't save him he had some he probably had some confidence that he is Jewish and you remember John the Baptist preached in Luke 3 their fruit and he he preached to Jewish people, especially to Pharisees. Bear fruits that benefit repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. This was the foolish confidence. What would be the counterpart of this attitude in the church today? It would be professing Christians who read this story and say, I am an eternally secure child of God. I am justified by faith alone. And this is, this is, the, this is the, the story how to handle money. And of course we can react, don't tell me how I should handle money. It doesn't affect my salvation or jeopardize my eternal destiny. And the answer to this contemporary form of cheap grace is this, the faith which justifies also purifies. That's the biblical teaching. It purifies from the love of money. The point of this story is that the rich man is in hell because he delighted more in luxuries for himself than in love of God and love for others. didn't make any difference that he thought he had a secure standing as a son of Abraham. He enjoyed luxuries of life more than God himself and he never trusted God's word. This does not mean that by using your money for the good of others and for Christ's purposes you buy a spot in heaven for yourself or you're going to earn the place in paradise not at all what it means is that the way you use your money shows whether your heart has been changed by the holy spirit so that the love for god and for others and not luxuries for yourself is what you long for and this is your true delight and the last section of this story deals with two different responses and this is very important for us to study this and to observe this in the story christ also recounted two different responses at the birth both the rich man and lazarus Possess the same natural condition, sinful condition. They were born in sin, separated from God under His wrath for sin. Neither of them had any merit before God. However, at some point in their lives, they made two different decisions, two different responses to God's Word. Lazarus believed the message of the Old Testament prophets he heard it and believed it but the rich man rejected their message so did his family jesus revealed these conclusions in verses 27 to 31 this is important for us to observe the rich man in torment asked abraham to send lazarus to his family to testify to them the rich man knew that his brothers faced the same destiny he desired for them to avoid 
this punishment. Abraham replied to him that his brothers could believe Moses and the prophet. In other words, the response to believe their message, the message of the Moses and the message of the prophets, made the difference in the destiny between Lazarus and rich man. That response to God's word, to scripture. Their contrasting positions in life had no influence upon. Notice these truths. The exalted position of the rich man did not qualify him for eternal life. And also the lowly position of Lazarus did not disqualify him for eternal life. The difference lay only in their different responses to the word of God. The rich man rejected Moses and the prophets while Lazarus believed them and trusted their message. That alone made a difference. That alone made a true difference. Jesus testified that Moses and prophets bear witness about him. We read this in Luke 24 and John 5. Those who believe on Jesus are not condemned. And those who did not believe are condemned already. The response to the word of God that Lazarus and rich Men may determine their different destiny, which confirms the message of Christ. Lazarus believed this message, which the prophets foretold or predicted. He inherited eternal life. The rich man rejected it and received his just punishment, eternal damnation and hell forever and ever. The same truth continues today as well. Destiny depends on your response to believe God's word or reject God's word. The prophets and Moses spoke of one who would come to pay the penalty of sin for sinners. They, as Jesus said, spoke of him, witness and bear witness of him. The rich man asked if Abraham will send Lazarus to warn his five brothers about the danger of hell. He knew that they they are living in the same lifestyle as he was. Abraham answered in verse 29, they have Moses and prophet let them hear them. In other words, God has already provided revelation in scripture of the Old Testament for them. And it is enough what Abraham is saying but the rich man knows that his brothers do not listen this to the scripture they may have devotions in the morning for a few minutes and they attend church maybe once a week but this is it he knows that their whole mindset about money and sinful pleasures of this world and that's it so in verse 30 He advises Abraham, imagine from hell, he advises Abraham about how to get his brothers to repent. And he says, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. If there could just be a resurrection from the dead, something really astonishing, some supernatural miracle then they would uh, wake up and they will they would repent they would forsake their selfish luxuries and start living for god and god's purpose then comes abraham's final stunning statement my dear friends he says if they do not hear moses and the prophets neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is incredible statement. Incredible statement. If a person would rise from the dead and testify of the horrors of hell, we presuppose that people would believe if they are witness his death and burial and then he comes to life again and testify about eternity this is our our assumption that people would believe and we need to present and show that person to the entire world 
and his testimony should be enough to produce faith in people. But this is not true. If a person is so in love with money in his sinful nature that he is blind to the commands and warning of Scripture, then even a resurrection from the dead will not bring about repentance in his life. Selfishness and, and love for money and self-love are so powerful that even supernatural miracle would not change that. There's no power to crush that self-love. And this was proved. If you remember another Lazarus who was raised from the dead and religious leaders of Judea and Jerusalem and the entire Israel refused to believe. And there was another resurrection, the most glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they refused to believe and accept. But by this also Abraham explains the power of Scripture. It is the Word of God that determines the destiny of all. And supernatural events do not convince sinners just as miracles of Christ and apostles and prophets only confirm their faith. It never produce true faith in people. So in the afterlife, those who are redeemed, they confess that it was faith that came by God's word that saved them. By God's word. Yesterday when I was working on this sermon, I was reminded of the horrors of hell. And I felt so terrible because how many people around me are going to hell. And I ask myself, what should my response be to this? To this tragedy that many people are going to hell what should be the response of the church what should we do about the fact that millions of people are going to the eternal punishment and eternal destruction around us and the answer is in this storm what produce repentance and faith what produce true repentance and true faith and the answer the word of god the scriptures that bear witness about christ that reveals the voice of christ that unleashes the power of god to resurrect the spiritually dead and hell-bound sinner and we just need to be faithful as isaiah in 62 6 says that we need to proclaim we need to be that watchman to proclaim the word of God. In Acts 18, 18, 19, God says for Paul in Corinth, don't be afraid, but proclaim my, my truth. Don't be silent in this city, but proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is encouragement for us, my dear friends, if you are Christian, this is the encouragement for us. Don't be silent. Preach, proclaim, declare, announce, testify, share, witness God's word, the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere, all the time. And this is the only one means for salvation of eternal soul. And there is an urgency to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere, all the time, because millions of people are going to hell and this is the only way for them to escape hell and to be resurrected from their spiritual deadness to hear the voice of Christ through Scripture or from Scripture. That's why we are the church, the biblical preaching church. This is why we believe that we need to proclaim the gospel and do this all the time everywhere. This is why we want to be so precise about Scripture and preach God's Word. Because this is the only one means to save the eternal souls. We can tell many stories here. We can entertain people and those people will going to go to hell forever and ever. There's an urgency 
to proclaim God's word. What a different in ex- difference in experience of these two men. Of course, these two men are still represented the entire human race this morning. The self-centered rich man is here, still had it for hell. The saint of God, still here, had it for heaven. And the question for you, which represents you today? Friend, this is no game we are playing here. We're dealing with the eternal destinies of people. We're dealing with the eternal souls. This is a definitely real. You will spend eternity in one of those two places I mentioned today. You will go either to heaven or you will go to hell. Which depends on what you do with the word of God that is about Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sins. If you want to be saved, you can come to him today. Trust him as your savior and he will save your soul. And this is my prayer that you would do this today. That you would be rescued from this eternal destruction that you deserve always remember jesus explained this place of hell more than heaven jesus spoke of hell more than love christ spoke of eternal destruction more than about church because this is important for the sinner to hear to understand that this is reality and this is god's love warning every sinner don't go there it's real don't go there you can escape by putting your trust in lord jesus christ and by submitting to him now pause and calculate one fact in your mind in the time it is taking to me to to say one sentence 20 people passing from this earthly life to eternity. 20 immortal souls being awakened in eternity because they died on earth. And this is just 10 seconds. Every second, two people die. And every minute, over 100 people die. Over one hour, 6,000 plus immortal souls enter eternity this is over 155,000 per day and about 56 million a year i believe that we must pause and reflect on the destination of all those travelers from this earth jesus did he preached about hell at the height of his popularity jesus gives the most complete warnings in all of God's word about the eternal horrors of hell this is what we should remember from this study that life is fragile life is fragile our lives are but a vapor the Lord says we can be healthy strong and full of life today a tiny virus can make us sick tomorrow and the next day we we shiver and the next day we dead life is fragile and death is inevitable we all have to die a few of us be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at Christ's coming but majority of people will enter eternity through physical death. Believers or unbelievers. It is inevitable. Death is unstoppable, inescapable. With, with the weather growing more violent in our world, people growing more openly wicked. With warfare becoming more globally lethal. With pandemics stalking the planet like never before life truly is fragile 
And God has said that death is inevitable. Christ is the only answer. Flu shots cannot help your soul. The United Nations is unable to, to help with the growing of evil or stop that. The only hope is found in God's word. And the only pathway to escape is laid out by him. Do you hold Christ today as your salvation? This is the question for you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And the question for you, are you trusting him now? Are you trusting him now for your salvation? And this is the only way to escape eternal damnation, eternal hell, eternal suffering through Jesus Christ. God the Father, the Holy God the Father crushed his son on the cross and in order to save you. And this is available for you right now to accept him as your Lord and Savior and be saved forever from eternal damnation. This is what we preach. And this is what we remind people. And this is what we proclaim. It is very close to you if you're here and you're in a state of unbelief. It is very close to you as a, as a criminal on the cross who pronounced a couple words and confessed Jesus as Lord and acknowledged his sinful nature and was saved instantly. If you are saved, then I challenge you to come before the Lord to praise him for your salvation. When you finish thanking him, then take time to pray for your family, for, for your friends that are lost. Get a hold of God for them and pray that they will be saved. Time is running out. And death is stalking every person in this world. Don't be silent. Don't be silent. But preach, proclaim, declare, announce, testify, share, witness God's word. The gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere, all the time. The time for salvation is now. The time of salvation is now. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to open your word. And we praise you for this passage. That gives us warning. Very serious warning. That the eternal damnation and eternal punishment and eternal torment is real. And this is what we deserve. This is what we deserve by our sinful nature. We who rebelled against you, against your holiness, against your righteousness... We who were your enemies. This is our just punishment. This is what we truly deserve. But by your mercy and grace. You in, in your unmeasurable love. And mercy and grace provided for us to weigh out. Through Jesus Christ. Through the redemption in his blood. We can be saved from just punishment and your holy wrath that we deserve and i pray for believers that we would be again awakened this morning this time that we would understand and praise you for this gift of salvation and we would be awakened and we would understand the eternal destiny of many other sinners and people around us that they are going into destruction, that we would pray for them earnestly, that we would proclaim your truth to them, that we would understand the urgency in that. Bless our hearts. And I pray for those people who are here who are not saved that you would extend your mercy to them and open their hearts and remove the blindness from their spiritual eyes that they would see the true Jesus. And you would change their hearts and Jesus would become precious for them. 
and they would start worshiping him. And this is our prayer, and we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.